Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. John Ward. I'm the director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health in, in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm also the associate editor for the Clinical Liver Disease Journal of uh, AASLD. And this is the webinar linked to a, a recent report in clinical liver disease uh, uh, profiling the hepatitis C care and elimination program in the uh, 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 Cree Nation of uh, a, um, um, in uh, central Saskatchewan, uh, Canada, um, in a, a very uh, well-developed program of, uh, uh, for, that, um, uh, for that community um, that involves very much uh, members of that community. And there's a lot of um, key lessons learned from this program, not only for indigenous communities, but indeed for any a hepatitis elimination program in, in terms of uh, uh, political awareness, community engagement, um, a, a model of care, and, and the um, ability to uh, track progress with uh, information and then uh, change the program over time through uh, that uh, evaluation data as well as other programmatic experiences. Um, um, uh, the uh, the issues of hepatitis C are also very much a problem, uh, very much an issue for indigenous communities, American Indians, Alaska Natives for the United States. So we're very, um, very um, appreciative of, of, of having the, the um, exploration of this report and this program uh, joined by uh, our, our colleagues in the United States that I'll be introducing in a moment to describe some programmatic experiences uh, in the United States, some of the lessons learned relevant to those programs in the US, as well as some of those experiences in the United States that can be added to the lessons learned from this program. Um, we're also very fortunate today to have a video that we'd like to start off with to really describe, I think in very much, very poignant terms of why this program is important for this community and how it's being implemented uh, uh, by the community. So let's start the video now and then we will move into um, the uh, authors of the report. Thank you. Akakoop is not different than any other First Nation. We're really feeling the effects of colonization, colonialism, and assimilation. The addictions and the uh, HIV infection and Hep C infections are uh, results of root issues. In Saskatchewan, we've had the highest rates of HIV and Hepatitis C in Canada for the past 10 years. We still have the highest rates. As we started to see the issues and challenges related to access to care, transportation, there was uh, clearly a need to reevaluate how care is being provided. So rather than having 20 or 30 people from a rural area or First Nation community try to make it to a city who have all the challenges around transportation and poverty and access to care, it just made sense to have myself go to, to where patients are. My daughter was a year old when I started using and I thought of it as an experiment and little did I know that it would just take me the one time to get addicted. A year into my addiction, I contracted hepatitis C. I didn't really know my parents were using until I was like about 11, until I first seen them stick a needle in each other's arm. And that's when I realized that my brother has nobody, so I have to step up and be there. I couldn't even be a child of my childhood. I never gave up on my mom, I never gave up hope on them. We sat down with the community and we developed an approach of trying to address Hep C and similarly bringing that treatment and care as close to home as possible. And so we really started to scale up Hep C treatment in community in about 2016. And the big impact with that was the advancement with the direct acting antivirals. Our first liver health event was literally December 7th of 2016. We had our clients coming through and it was open to all community members, anybody who wanted to have their liver checked to take away the stigma of hepatitis C from the picture. 
When I'd go see the nurses at the clinic, like uh, Tanis and Vanessa and Marie, they were very welcoming. I was so ashamed to talk about it even, but somehow they made me feel relaxed enough where I was able to answer personal questions and not avoid them. So it was a very comfortable, calming place to go. They helped in so many ways. Part of the key steps for Jody after she was actually tested positive for a POC test for the hep C antibody, we had to monitor her liver and then do, of course, blood work to check on her liver, how it was doing. And she was doing excellent. It was, it was doing, like, really good. So she just ended up being on a 12-week program. In medicine, there's only a number of illnesses we can cure. And to see people's faces and reactions and expressions when you can say you're cured, you did it. <laughs> yes. I wanted to scream, I wanted to dance, you know, it was just, it was an amazing, uh, amazing time in my life. You're cleared, your uh, viral load is not detected. I sat there and I had to think about it because I never thought I would ever have it cured. See the impact it has on someone. It's just, it's fantastic. You may have not taught me how to be a daughter, but a young kid, but you're teaching me how to be a good woman. I never gave up on you, ever. Since being cured of hepatitis C, it's made a big, a big impact on my life. Realizing I'm not living there anymore, I'm living here. Hepatitis C cured, Jody. the Know Your Status outreach worker, Jody. You know, and the kind and caring, loving Jody. Thank you. That you know, video really shows in human terms what the program, you know, is all about. You know, we have a you know, saying here at the task force that you know, you know, behind, never forget that behind the uh, numbers there are faces, and that's really just another uh, reminder of that. But we would like to get a little bit of more detail about the program itself uh, from uh, Noreen Reed, who was the uh, nurse that really was the. Uh, um, was responsible for for this program, and she just could, um, you know, take us through some of the highlights of the report, which I encourage everyone uh, on the webinar today to read because it's really uh, a concisely but very well uh, written a description of the program uh, to give us some some highlights of the program so that uh, we can get some questions and discussion going uh, among ourselves on the webinar. But I'd like also the, the webinar viewers to please uh, place your questions and comments in the chat and we'll do our best to, uh, to get to those uh, later in the program. So let me turn it over to Noreen to, uh, to, uh, to describe it. Um, good morning, Noreen. Good day. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share. Um, I first like to start out by acknowledging all the indigenous lands of all the participants in this webinar today. And I would like to specifically acknowledge my homelands of Treaty 6 here in Saskatchewan. So our hepatitis C and elimination had attack creation in indigenous uh, community led model. Um, the, the objectives of this, of this uh, was to describe uh, the indigenous community led uh, HCV program and elimination campaign from the inception to its current state and outcomes. Um, and next slide. Just a little bit about, I think you got the context of uh, Ataka Kupri Nation, which is a, a Cree community and uh, Indigenous community in rural central Saskatchewan, Canada. And we have approx had approximately about 12.5% of the community population, um, 200 cases within an N of 1600 had a history of HCV, meaning that they had tested uh, HCV pos antibody positive at some point in, uh, in their history. Um, an existing program of uh, serving HIV clients identified about 97% of the HCV antibody positive 
uh, clients, pardon me, clients to be HCV uh, antibody positive with few receiving actual HCV treatment. We're doing a really fantastic job with the HIV clients in the Know Your Status program. Um, and we were seeing co-infections and, and, and we were not um, catching that piece of treatment. Next slide. So some of the highlights, um, the program itself is a very comprehensive uh, hepatitis C care, mo care um, virus, HCV mo care model, pardon me. Um, and it's really built on the foundations of the currently uh, or previously existing community-based HIV model care termed uh, the Know Your Status, which is uh, um, a community-based uh, program that was developed in response to the HIV crisis in uh, uh, the mid uh, 2000s, um, which the foundations of, uh, of this uh, program were education, testing, clinical management, case management, and of course, treatment and ongoing monitoring and harm reduction. Um, so we built, um, uh, modeled the uh, HCV model based off of that. So it's encompassing, it's all one program now. Um, employ, employees learning uh, healthcare system framework and um, next slide, please. Uh, so our elimination plan, uh, oh yeah, uh, occurred in sort of uh, different steps. So education and advocacy is the first uh, piece, education within community, um, leadership, partners, um, staff, and advocacy on many levels with, um, within the client population, um, within our leadership before uh, we could move ahead with any programs within our community, we have to uh, have our chief and council leadership approval and have them on board so that we can have a successful program to meet the needs of the clients. Um, and encouraging, um, encourage HCV screening uptake. So really promoting and educating and, and um, in through the education and advocacy and encouraging screening and uh, screening we've um, try to um, reduce the stigma of H, uh, pardon me, of hepatitis C, so that it wasn't seen as a bad thing to do. Engagement into care was the, is the next phase. Um, so this is a this is the the bigger piece, the more challenging piece, because of the assessing and preparing for treatment. So here, um, the clients really need to um, know what they're getting into, what they have to do, what their goals are, and the nursing team and the team in itself to, to meet in the middle and meet that client really where they're at and determining if they are actually uh, ready for uh, an aggressive treatment of uh, 12 weeks or whatever it may take for, for their treatment. Um, and really it's about meeting the clients where they're at. So this, this stage, this step in the plan sometimes takes a bit longer. And then once we um, get through those, those pieces of the engagement, we move on to the treatment and uh, overall treatment and case management, and then the ongoing uh, monitoring of, of uh, treatment. So even though we've put a client through treatment and um, has been successful, we still continue to monitor uh, the outcomes of all the clients in the program, um, whether they are continuing to substance use, we need to ensure that um, they're getting still get engaged in care and being monitored to prevent any reinfections or address any of their other needs that may need to be um, uh, assist, have required assistance with. And then we, um, Moving on to the uh, last piece is, of course, our program evaluation and knowledge translation. And the next slide. So our team is quite comprehensive. Um, of course, above, um, before we could establish teams, our, our, our key leader would be our leadership and our chief and council and in community to uh, allow um, these teams to develop. So we have a uh, in community, uh, healthcare team, and we have the visiting healthcare uh, professionals. The community is based on a on a public health um, uh, funding agreement with the uh, federal government. So we don't have any of the primary care services. So we had to partner and look to our um, outside partnerships to come in and, and assist us with our, our programming. 
I think for the sake of time, I won't list through, but just in general, you have your nursing team peers or elders or elders provide us guidance um, as far as uh, next steps, community outreach workers and mental health. Okay, I think that's the next steps. This is our page of references here. Um, any questions in the next slide? And I think the slide after that will be. Sure, great. Thanks everyone. Um, my name is uh, Stuart Skinner. I'm an infectious disease doc in Regina, uh, Saskatchewan. I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, I'm on Treaty 4 territory, as well as the uh, traditional homelands of our Métis people. Um, so I've been um, working in Attaka Coop for 11 years and just uh, wanted to kind of provide an update with some of the most recent data and outcomes uh, that we have kind of effective March 2021. Um, we're still working through this data, but I think it's important to show uh, this additional success. Um, these type of programs, community-based programs, um, and especially in our First Nation communities take time to, to build and develop. It takes a long time uh, to establish trust um, with communities, but also establish trust with uh, patients. Um, and especially here in, for us in Saskatchewan in Canada, um, the, the mistrust and the way our Indigenous people have been treated um, um, leads to that mistrust that takes a long time uh, to develop and rebuild. Um, and so programs will be slow uh, to develop and just continually to improve over time. Um, we're really proud of these outcomes and particularly when we look at the hardest to reach or hardest to treat population. Um, this community has done incredible work, uh, obviously in a rural community, um, an hour away from any you know, primary care lab or pharmacy services, um, a very kind of, a, community that's spread out over a large area. Um, the vast majority of our patients who have connected into the program have a history of injection drug use and the vast majority are still um, uh, actively using or, or relapse. Um, and uh, taking that all into account, um, again, like I said, no primary care, uh, no other chronic disease care um, to achieve these outcomes uh, for the community is, is really empowering to the community and hopefully changes the way we can approach health. So just overall, 34% um, of the adult population in the community has been screened at least once. Uh, many people have been uh, screened multiple times. These are often due through liver health events, testing days, um, organized and run by the community, um, which makes it an event to come and, and get everything done that you need to get done. And through that, um, Noreen had mentioned there's uh, 200 hep C antibody patients that were identified. Um, through this program, we identified uh, 94. Um, and uh, of those who then engage into the program, which is uh, 63, we've been able to treat 68. So uh, about 98% of people are offered treatment. We have a, basically a zero barrier uh, to treat, we, regardless of where a person's at uh, in terms of substance use. Um, we will offer treatment and leave it up to the patient to decide whether or not they want treatment. And the biggest, you know, sometimes the reasons we don't is just uh, they are not uh, ready for treatment, and then we will wait until they are. Um, when we do start treatment, because of all the community support, the majority of, of individuals complete treatment, and you know our cure rates are about 77%. Um, some of that is because of just treating a fairly chaotic population. Many people have not come back for their test to cure, uh, and uh, that can drop our cure rates, but at I also look at it at 80% cure rate is pretty fantastic. Um, and then with the ongoing screening and treatment initiations, we do see reinfections, we will treat reinfections. And then we also try to look at the you know, surrounding uh, um, environment and partners to offer support, um, um, you know, say cohort-based treatment um, 
to try and uh, limit further reinfections. And even through COVID-19 here, um, most of the, the primary health center was closed down. Um, even my ability to go out was uh, slowed down, but we're still able to treat people through COVID. And we did that remotely. Um, again, we have a zero barrier threshold to treatment. So whether that's through uh, telehealth or virtual care, or even phone calls because of that community support. So you know, our next steps is looking at those patients who are not uh, connected in and uh, there's lots of reasons for that. And I think the, the, the next step in where we want to go is, is engaging those people with lived experiences and peers um, further, uh, building that program and, and looking at, you know, uh, very unique ways of, of treating uh, those individuals who don't want to come to the health center or engage in the program, uh, such as a peer led or peer based treatment model. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, pass it on to Jody. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stu and Noreen. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat regarding uh, some aspects of the program. If you could go ahead and respond to those while, uh, um, while Jolie starts to um, describe her role in the program, I think that will, that will help um, make sure that those questions are answered. Um, thank you. Um, um, I think we'll move. Uh, over to uh, Jody Albert, who can describe her work in community outreach in the program. Jody, you on? You're muted, Jody. There you Sorry go. about that. Gotcha. They, my name is Jody Albert. Um, first of all, I would like to. Uh, Thank the Neuer Status team here at Attack Coupel Center for um, for treating me like I was a human being. Um, to me, it seemed like they were able to see past the diagnosis and the addiction and uh, see me as a, as a person, as a woman. Um, I believe this is what um, really made the the biggest impact for me um, being successful in my treatment. And um, yeah, so. Being um, treated this way, it gave me um, courage and strength, I guess, to uh, to make those necessary changes in my life that weren't, um, yeah, that were um, that were um, harming me. And um, it also it also encouraged me to uh, to treat other people that way to to pass on the treatment. So that was um, that was really nice. So. I would just like to say that. Um, so my role as an your status worker, um, outreach worker was um, was many things. It was it was many things. Um, I would uh, take clients to and from the health center that they didn't have a ride if they needed to see Dr. Skinner or one of the nurses. Um, I would take them to the doctor in Prince Albert to. Um, whatever needs that they, they, they required. And I believe that doing these, these short distances, traveling with them was, is making that connection. I think making that connection is really vital, really, really vital because if you're not gonna connect with anybody, then I don't believe that the, the work would be, uh, would be done. Um, there was, um, times when um, I would, I even started taking um, the community members to NA meetings in the city in Prince Albert, which is an hour away. So I would just find ways to um, spend as much time with them during work hours or even sometimes after work hours and make that connection, you know, and having lived experience being an addict and um, going through the treatment, you know, I was comfortable enough to share, comfortable enough to share and, um, you know, I, I, I would, I hoped that it would um, encourage them to uh, to make the necessary steps to to cure their to treat their HCV and uh, just to connect to care, just to connect to care, and you know, um, having the proper medical practitioners and professionals makes the difference. You know, like I can make that necessary connection and make that uh, connect to care. But if they're, um, if our medical professionals aren't going to be inviting and, and 
and um, being kind and compassionate and respectful, then they're not going to finish the treatment. You know, you're they're, you're going to scare them off. So um, I believe that's that's really important, really really important. Um, yeah, there was. Uh, it's just that making that that connection, you know, just looking past the disease and the, the addictions and seeing that person, actually seeing that person, hearing that person and uh, listening to that person, you know, like it's um, that's what I find is really, really important. So, Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much. Um, sure, people have uh, questions. Look forward to more follow up about that. But let's talk. Uh, let's turn to. Uh, uh, Jolie Asa Camus, who uh, um, you know, has very interesting uh, um, connection both with the U.S. and the uh, Canada as far as Indigenous communities in her own personal life, and she's also responsible for uh, uh, studies um, that we have um, been hearing about. So just look forward to uh, um, uh, Jolie describing her 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 personal. Uh, connections with uh, Hep C elimination as well as her uh, professional and academic ones, please. Hi, thank you for that. My name is Jolie Sasakamus. I am from Chiging First Nation in Ontario, which is a Robinson Huron Treaty. I'm also an active member of the Takakut Cree Nation, where my late husband Derek is from, was from, and also he's the son of the late Fred Sasakamus, who is the first NHL hockey player for the Chicago Blackhawks. <clears throat> and so I'm located right now on Treaty 4, and I live and work in Treaty 6. And I just want to clarify a little bit about the terminology we're using, because this specific program we're talking about in Attack was specific to First Nations, which is um, people who live on in their community. And so we have a lot of um, disparity in Canada, but we, we term Indigenous to kind of reference First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and that could refer to people on reserve, off reserve, urban status, non-status. And this particular program was specific to on reserve. And I just want to clarify that because <clears throat> my late husband, while he was from a tech coop, we lived in Regina. And I believe that um, my late husband passed away from hepatitis C. And I believe it was due to racism in the healthcare system. And had he not experienced that racism, he might have engaged back into care. If we would have been on reserve, I believe that because of it being people like Jody and family that he would have been engaged in care. And that didn't happen. So the racism that he experienced in the city center was that my husband had had hep C before and was cured traditionally with traditional medicine. And it's well known by our people that we do have traditional medicines for hep C. Um, they always don't have access to them. And I know that some of our doctors here actually work alongside of those traditional approaches as well. And that was one of the things that I think that Takakoop is known for if someone wants to use traditional medicines they're supported. And that was not supported in this urban center. And so what happened is it just disengaged my husband completely from even wanting to participate in care at all. And so we didn't find out that he had hepatitis C. I didn't find out until he ended up in the, ho in the hospital and was in a coma four days later and then passed away 15 days after that with complete liver failure. So to me, when I found out he had hep C and I asked him, knowing that I'm, I forgot to introduce what I do, I'm an associate professor at the University of Regina in educational psychology and counseling. And I work with Stu Skinner and the medical team. I'm the research director for the, for the Wellness Wheel Medical Clinic. So when I asked my husband, you know that I research this, you know, and I work with the best, best doctors in the country, why didn't you come to me? Why didn't you tell me we could have gotten you help? We thought we were getting him help actually. And he said it was because he was ashamed. And it broke my heart because I thought if you're ashamed to tell me and I work in this field and this team is compassionate then how does someone else who doesn't have these tools and resources get engaged in care or even come forward to say I might have hep C like even to just say that I might have it. So I think it's really important that we go to the people that we have like Jody said people who made her feel welcome and safe because um, the smallest thing can disengage someone immediately from care. And the other thing that I get concerned about is the people who tend to get hep C in our community are vulnerable and have lifestyles that are um, make it more difficult to engage in care. And by that, I don't necessarily mean drugs and alcohol. I mean homelessness. I mean lack of transportation, things that we get stereotyped in this country and in this province for our HIV and hep C being all addicts and prostitutes and this really dark narrative that we get us, uh, uh, imposed upon us. And people don't recognize our history 
of residential schools and colonization and, and literally having passes that we needed to leave our reserves at one point. We had to have a physical pass from the Indian agents so we could leave our reserve. People don't understand that history is not history. It was like yesterday. And we live that in our bodies, we live it in our hearts and we live it in our minds. And so I believe that my husband would not engage in care because he was ashamed to tell the non-Indigenous people that he had it, he was embarrassed and they knew he had it and yet they did not make any attempts to really make any contact. And so I guess I hope for this, that people understand that the program on reserve works and we are also modifying this to the urban population here in Regina. So we'll know in the next year or so whether the adaptation of this model works. And um, yeah, I guess that's all I really have to say, but just from a, from a lived experience, when you have a disease that's preventable and treatable and someone dies, it is the most heartbreaking thing you can ever endure. And I don't wanna see another person die unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think anyone should be dying of hepatitis C um, anymore. I was a question for both you, Jolie and Jody, and perhaps for all, I mean, how has the community responded to this program? Do, how aware are they of this, uh, uh, the accomplishments of the program, how it's been impeding the health of the community and how it really is a role model for the whole country, if not other parts of the world. I mean, is this a source of pride for the community or how do you think it's viewed by the community at large, please? I can speak a little bit to that and then maybe Jody, you might have, um, I know we, we keep the um, leadership involved and they're kind of the, there are, there are support, supporters and mover forwards with, uh, uh, with the information that we, we share all annually with the community, any successes and reports through an annual report. Um, I think as far as, uh, it, it's a very humble community. So um, I think that um, it's acknowledged, but I'll be honest, I don't know if the clients really, uh, clients and some community members really um, know the degree of, of the success of what this means. I think they see it as a great option to services in the community and more programs, more things locally to help improve over health, overall health. Um, but I don't think um, they, they see the big picture of what this impact could be by their involvement and, and being a community-led um, program. Mm -hmm. okay. I would like to agree with Noreen on that. Um, when I was taking the treatment, um, I was, I lived with hepatitis C for 14 years and I just felt like I was going to live with it for the rest of my life. So going through the treatment, it wasn't as exciting as I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't too excited about it. I wasn't, um, it wasn't really sinking in as to how my life was going to change. It wasn't, but it was the nurses <laughs> that would get so excited to see me when I'd go into the offices or when I finished my first month of the, 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 the treatment, you know, the second month and then you know, they would get excited and it was a celebration, you know, it was, it was really them that really got me excited about it because I didn't really understand, you know, I didn't, you know, my life was, uh, was unhealthy. It was, I didn't have no self-esteem, you know, my confidence was really low. Um, so, you know, when it, it was really hard for me to understand that. And then towards the end, when I realized and I had to, and Dr. Skinner would sat, sat, sat down with me and he showed me on paper what, like actually seeing that my viral load was undetectable. You know, that's when it was able to sink in a little more easier too. You know, it was, um, it was, um, it took a while. It took a while for me. So I can't talk for other people, but I imagine that their lifestyles, you know, being homeless, couch surfing, hungry, um, struggling with addiction, you know, that's, that's not the, on top of their list, you know, but at the same time, um, when I finished my treatment and we did the video with Inshu, it was, uh, it was, um, an incredible experience as well. And then the community members were able to see it. It was shared on social media. 
you know, and, um, and then we did do, we do, we did do some newsletters for the community and we'd share information on that. So we were, um, we were uh, trying to get the word out there as much as we could. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let's hear from Jessica Leston. Um, um, we could have her inter uh, introductory slide there. Um, uh, Jessica has worked for many years uh, with um, American Indian communities, uh, uh, currently with the Northwest Portland Area of Indian Health Board. And I'd like for Jessica to share some of her experiences in her work and so we can you know, compare that to some of the work that we've been hearing about um, here in Saskatchewan. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica, are you are you on? Did you want me to unmute myself? I think that might be a good idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Jessica DYU. Uh, good day. My name is Jessica. My mother's side of the family are settlers to Turtle Island, originally from Germany, Ireland, and Sweden. My father's side of the family are settlers from Finland and Austria, and indigenous uh, Simpson from Southeast Alaska. Uh, just thank you so much for the opportunity to be in community with you all today, um, Dr. Skinner and Noreen for all the work that you are doing and um, Jody and Jolie for the work and the stories that you shared and the power in those stories. Um, I've worked in tribal health care for 17 years uh, and currently at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. The board serves the 43 tribes of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, though much of my work is national in scope uh, and spans Indian country, especially as it relates to hepatitis, HIV, and infectious disease. And uh, when I'm saying Indian country, um, it's a very positivist reclaiming, reclaiming term um, that many indigenous people use in the, in, in, um, the United States. And uh, I do also wanna note that um, there are 474 different tribes um, and it's not a monolith of indigenous culture. Every single tribe has their own um, government, their own culture, their own history and their own experience with colonization. Um, so with that said, I'll just take a few minutes to briefly go over the hepatitis C journey from a national perspective, working with federal tribal and urban facilities in the United States. Next slide, please. I see a lot of similarities um, with our Canadian colleagues, um, a lot of them. And I just put some images up here that kind of speaks to some of the work that we've done. Um, but one item that struck me from their paper was that their access to DAAs started in 2016. That's a full four years after the DAA introduction. Um, and everyone here is going to be familiar with the paradox faced for health systems in the early years. These drugs were life-saving um, and even in their record-setting prices, arguably cost-effective at an individual level. The high SVR rates um, with few side effects changed everything about how we could address hepatitis C, but the drugs were not affordable at any kind of reasonable scale and treatment remained rationed and um, very rare in Indian country. And while the barriers to drug access are much lower than they were before in the beginning, um, barriers still exist in many states and within many Indian Health Service tribal and urban facilities. Next slide, please. And um, ID related challenges, hepatitis C related challenges are not happening in isolation um, and are not very different from other health issues in the Indian health system. It's really well document, documented that determinants of health are at the core of the issue. Many communities have both a disparity in poor health outcomes compared to the national average, as well as a disparity in the lack of healthcare resources um, to address them. In investing in interventions um, that address non-medical health-related social needs, it was noted that while healthcare accounts for some 10 to 20% of the determinants of health, socioeconomic factors and factors related to the physical environment are estimated to account for up to 50% of the determinants of health. So we, we, we just must address these factors if we wanna elevate the health of all. Next slide, please. 
Even with the increasing DAA access, the Indian health system then has a, another difficulty meeting the needs of the population that it exists to serve based on treaty. Uh, one in four physician positions are vacant in the health system and turnover is high. Uh, the average healthcare facility is 40 years old compared with the 10 year average um, for the US as a whole. And finally, per capita user health expend expenditure is less than half of the US average. Of course, in an under-resourced system like this, um, it's going to struggle to have good health outcomes. And while uh, my colleague, Dr. McMahon, will share some of the amazing successes from Alaska, many tribal nations are still struggling today to meet the needs of hepatitis C treatment. Next slide, please. And budget disparities and outdated medical facilities are not bad luck, or they're not a bad card. They are policy choices. Um, as an example, another federal agency that provides direct health care to patients is the Veterans Administration. It's a constituency that arguably has a much higher profile than tribal nations in the eyes of um, the general US population. The VA serves four times as many patients as the Indian health system, but has 31 times as many physicians. Um, other key, uh, the VA has received several billion dollars for hepatitis C treatment. The Indian health system has received zero dollars for hepatitis C treatment. Um, other key services that are, of course, part of hepatitis C elimination are also not funded. Uh, the VA has an opioid use disorder and mental health and substance use disorder budget 66 and 27 times greater than the Indian health system. Uh, my purpose absolutely is not to disparage the VA, go VA, um, but rather to show that this under-resourcing is a deliberate policy choice and it's a deliberate policy, policy choice that can be changed. Um, and I understand that budget is not alone uh, sufficient to eliminate hepatitis C, but it's absolutely a necessary one. Um, and resources have translated into outcomes here. The VA has nearly eliminated hepatitis C from their population, uh, and the Indian health system has no target date to do so. Next slide. So I know that was all a lot of, you know, seemingly negative, but it's the facts and the truth, and it's something that we absolutely have to move through in order to change. Um, but there have been tons of successes in Indian country as well, like the example from Saskatchewan, successful programs in our system have consisted of local prioritization and customization of hepatitis C programs for outreach, for testing, for treatment, uh, and elimination programs are underway in several of our tribal networks. Uh, one main pillar of our ITU response so far has been screening using a national recommendation as rationale. Uh, best practices like clinical decision tools and EHR prompts have resulted in our national hepatitis, screen, hepatitis C screening average going from 11% in 2012 to um, 60% in 2020. And then of course all of this screening has led to the inevitable question what do we do for our patients who test positive um, in a system that's far from specialists like Saskatchewan, that's understaffed, probably like Saskatchewan, and unable to afford the medications? Next slide. Our solution and our strength in treatment has really been from our clinical community brought together by our Indian country ECHO clinics. From um, starting with one single clinic a month, we've expanded to several clinics each month nationwide. And we create communities of practice to improve hepatitis C treatment access and quality care for our people. And in doing so, patients are treated right in their community uh, by clinicians who they know and who they trust. Collectively, the Indian country um, tele-echo consultations have helped treatment for over a thousand different patients directly and thousands of more indirectly. And in fact, tele-echo support is a key factor in the existence of most of the hepatitis C programs that are out there in Indian country. In an evaluation, we found that uh, about 44% of the facilities were using Indian country echo services. The ones who were using those services accounted for 92% of the DAA prescriptions in the network. Next slide. 
Uh, and just on a personal level, working on the problems presented by hepatitis C mortality, which is double uh, in our population, um, has been a journey from local screening programs to demanding resources for the Indian health system. Hepatitis C mortality in the US, including tribal nations, is finally trending down, and I'm grateful to have been part of this national effort and continue to be part of it. Um, but I'm also really frustrated to know that what might be. Um, and I'm more aware of ever that the impact of policy choices, both historical and present day, um, um, what they're having on our tribal nations. And uh, I won't stop and I won't be quiet until um, treatment for hepatitis C is available to all of my people. Dykeson, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Jessica. That, that was a very thorough uh, the, uh, description of the issues. Uh, you have some questions in the in the chat uh, that you could respond to, please. And then, uh, Stuart and Irene, I think you have a question over in Q and A uh, specific to the program. If you could respond to that, and maybe bring it over into chat, so people we can have them all together. Meanwhile, I'd like to turn to Brian McMahon to describe uh, the um, uh, uh, hepatitis. Uh, uh, Prevention, care, and treatment activities for uh, uh, Alaskan natives. Uh, Brian uh, has been working uh, in that population uh, for decades and uh, is, um, uh, has a lot to share. But uh, hopefully, we can get some highlights over the next uh, five to seven minutes. Brian, thanks a lot, John. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank Good. you. Good. Okay. Well, uh, I, I want to acknowledge the the land uh, uh, all of, in all of Alaska the, that's of uh, the Alaska Native people. Uh, and uh, I also want to say that I, I found out uh, two weeks ago from one of my cousins who that oh, I know that my family, my mother's family is Iber, comes from Quebec. And I found out when she went back to, to the 14th century that there is uh, Quebec uh, First Nations uh, relatives that we have in our family. So that was pretty exciting for me to, to learn that. Um, so I came to Alaska in the early 1970s. I spent two years on the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta uh, and uh, worked as a physician in the hospital there, just in general physician. Did my specialty training and ended up as a hepatologist. And now I work in Anchorage. And uh, in, uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So as everyone has said, who's talked already that there's very high rates of hepatitis B in Alaska Native and uh, American Indian and, and Canadians uh, First Nations people. Um, we've tested about 30,000 people. Uh, the population is about 170,000 Alaska, Alaska Natives. And we've treated 1,000 people with DAA, and we have a high SVR rate. But that is reflecting the fact that we've picked people who are, who are not necessarily continuing to use, met, to use uh, injecting drugs. We offer it to everybody who uses injecting drugs, but it's really hard to get those people in. And I'm learned, I've learned so much from the presenters before me about the need for community health workers to go out and work with these people and help to bring them into the clinic who are still injecting drugs. So um, that's a real big challenge that we have. We just started a program with one of the other tribal organizations, South Central Foundation in the homeless shelter uh, to try to screen and treat there. Now, of those thousand people that we've treated and uh, with DAAs, 600 are in Anchorage, um, and uh, the local primary care uh, tribal organization, South Central Foundation, has transitioned that from uh, physicians to pharmacists. So that really uh, creates a lot more efficient system. 400 are in rural clinics, and these rural clinics are located, uh, these are rural hospitals and large clinics located in the, in the, big, the big cities of Alaska, which are uh, big cities meaning about 10,000, 15,000, such as Nome and Ketchikan and Bethel and Uktiavik, which used to be, uh, was, was, the, was called, uh, was used to be Barrow, the, the new indigenous name, uh, Fairbanks um, and those places where we have uh, good uh, primary care providers and some uh, internal medicines and pediatric specialists. However, we know of 180 people that are living in rural isolated villages. There are over 200 in Alaska off the road system. 
And these people have tremendous barriers to not only access, accessing treatment, but even to get screening. They have to fly two to four times to the nearest facility, sometimes more than uh, 150 kilometers away by plane uh, to get treated by a licensed provider. So that's a huge challenge for us. Next slide, please. Now, one thing in Alaska that we've seen is that we could eliminate, uh, if we had enough resources, we could eliminate hepatitis C in the Alaska native population, but that wouldn't really eliminate in the population because there's so much interaction between Alaska native people and people of other racial and ethnic groups. So we have uh, developed a program with the state of Alaska, the Alaska prison system, the needle exchange program, the homeless shelter, the federally funded community clinic and the private sector. It's called the hog. Uh, it's not uh, the, uh, the animal hog, but the Hepatitis Air uh, Alaska Working Group. And we meet on a regular basis. We've, we've been sort of uh, uh, not being able to meet as much with, with COVID. And we work together to try to eliminate Hepatitis C. In the prison system in Alaska, which Alaska, there are a lot of, there's a disproportionate number of Alaska Native people in prison. 20% of uh, people in prisons are infected with Hep C. They are now screening everybody and they are offering treatment to anybody who is going to be there for uh, at least um, six to nine months. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one, one of the things that we've done is because we had a lot of providers after interferon that were afraid of hepatitis C, afraid to, to start treating patients. So we developed a one-day program with the state and with the prison systems and others to educate nurses, pharmacists, uh, and, uh, and providers about hepatitis C and uh, give uh, continued ed education credit for free. There's no tuition. Um, and we, they learned about the epidemiology, what are the screening strategies, how to use the direct acting antiviral medications, how to fill out the various uh, insurance forms and free drug forms to get everybody treated. And then this has expanded uh, the number of providers in Alaska uh, from a dozen uh, in, in 2015 to well over 100 statewide that are comfortable treating hepatitis C. Um, next slide. So how do we reach those people that are living, the almost 50% of the population that are living in the isolated communities that aren't getting these services now? So we've uh, developed, we've got a grant from CDC to start, and we are putting in a PCOR grant uh, today, actually it's going in today. And we are going to develop a program based on the program we use for the, for the primary care providers to train the indigenous community health aid providers. So each one of these uh, 200 communities has a little clinic and they have a person from the community that receives 16 weeks of training is certified by the state of Alaska. They run the clinic. They, they uh, can't prescribe medications, but they're on the phone with the doctors all the time. They do have a pharmacy there. They learn how to suture, draw bloods, uh, take care of urgent emergencies. So these people, these community health workers are the perfect people to treat hepatitis C. And so what we're, what we're this grant is to start out uh, to, uh, in five villages to screen all the residents using a rapid uh, finger stick HCV test from 18 to 80. If they're positive, they'll draw blood, send, spin, uh, spin it down, send it into our laboratory. We'll do the PCR test. And then, um, and then what we'll do is using telemedicine. This is different from ECHO because we'll have the patient present and we'll have the health aid present. We will treat that patient uh, by uh, several visits so that it's one-stop shopping. Get screened in your own community, get treated in your community, and you don't have to get on an airplane three or four times to fly to the nearest uh, facility. And then as part of the PCORI and the CDC grant, we're gonna compare the rates of SVR uh, that we obtain in these villages, uh, in these communities, to the rate that we get in the specialty clinic, uh, our specialty clinic in Anchorage. Um, so hopefully with, if we get the PCORI, we're gonna expand to 25 uh, uh, communities, and then we'll gradually uh, get the tribal organizations to implement this in all communities. Uh, next slide. I think that's the. I think that's the last slide. Um, so anyway, uh, I am really happy to hear uh, about uh, what 
the other speakers have said, and I realize now that we really need to figure out a way to get community health, uh, to get uh, advocates uh, to uh, help us uh, uh, to get patients that are difficult to treat, such as those who are continuing to use injecting drugs. And so that, in addition to treating people uh, that live in rural communities, is our big challenge for the next uh, year or two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. And Brian, Jessica, I didn't know if you had any questions for uh, uh, Noreen and uh, Stu and uh, um, Jody about their program or any other comments about it specifically. Or Brian. I would just like to follow up with Brian a little bit. Um, um, this is Jolie. I'm really happy to hear that you're using that peer health advocacy model. I'll just speak for a moment about what the KYS program did for Wellness Wheel Medical Clinic in general, which is beyond just hepatitis C and HIV. So we look at chronic disease management, prevention, treatment, and coordination of care from diabetes, hep C, HIV, all of them. And one of the things that the KYS model showed us early on in Attack Coop was that the peer approach worked and worked extraordinarily well. So we've taken that model and we're applying it to diabetes, to youth, to elders, uh, traditional parenting with mamas. Like we are applying this sort of peer approach to every single um, prevention model that we have and we're finding it phenomenal. So I'm really happy to hear uh, Brian say that they're using that community health worker model. And the other thing I wanna say is, um, like I said in the beginning, that this is really an on-reserve model and I'm actually applying. <clears throat> so usually what we do is create, we create on-reserve and we um, model back to urban. So what I'm trying to do is take the model from a TACACOOP, recognizing that in particular HCV patients don't necessarily engage for the whole time of their care, so they don't complete care, where, uh, because I'm a master, my teaching the master's in counseling, I have counseling students at my beck and call. So what we're gonna do is create a group therapy experience around the HCV cohort. So say it's the eight week cohort, then we'll add two weeks onto each end. And we're gonna add land-based therapies as well as expressive art therapies to support them uh, in a group so that they can cohort through the treatment program together. We're getting ready to launch that, I would say, this summer. Um, so that would be really exciting to check back and see how that model works out and if we're actually successful in engaging them in the entire treatment program. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're way ahead of us uh, as far as uh, peer advocacy. We realize that that's our next step. And uh, it's really uh, been really nice for me to, to hear what you have to say and learn from you about how successful that, that program is. Thank you, Brian. Hopefully those discussions, we can find a way to make them continue. Jessica, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I had a question. Um, one of our successful hepatitis C elimination programs has had uh, is recruiting a lot of treatment through their syringe service program. And so I was wondering if they're, um, if you're finding the same thing there or um, uh, how you're, you know, like how you're engaging um, people who are actively um, using drugs. Are you talking about Alaska, Jessica, or are you talking about Canada? No, sorry. Start, Canada. Starting with Canada, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the health center runs a harm reduction needle distribution program. So our clients are um, consistently engaged through that process. Um, and also there is some after uh, our support group work being done uh, through the mental health and addictions team. So they have that opportunity to be engaged then. And just individually reaching out um, by the team to those individuals who are actively uh, injecting substances. Mm -hmm. We also had a, um, we, had, we called it Harvey's Coffee Shop in the mornings, every Monday mornings for half a day. We provided um, breakfast, they would cook for themselves and then we'd sit around, play cards or um, um, just just sit down and talk with them. You know, we um, made that connection there and just giving information and uh, yeah, feeding them, feeding them. Thank so you. that was uh, that was a big success, but we had to shut it down because of COVID. So hopefully we can get that up and running again soon. I hope so too. I think we're out of time. Just want to thank everyone for, for sharing their information and their personal stories and experiences. I've really greatly I've got a lot out of it on a, just a sort of my professional level, but also on a personal one as well. So just thank you so much again and for being such uh, 
uh, such passionate champions for the health of your communities and for hepatitis C uh, elimination in particular, a goal that we all uh, share. So thank you again. Uh, there's an evaluation uh, sheet for those on the webinar. Please fill it out so we can um, continue to find a way to improve these as we move along. Thank you everyone for your attention and uh, participation and, and look forward to uh, uh, a next webinar next month. And just follow us on, uh, on Twitter at Global Health for more information about this webinar series. Thank you again and bye-bye. Are we done? Are we done? Yeah. Okay, hope so. Thank you. That was that was so so um, helpful. I can't thank you enough for participating, all of you. That was that was really really great to all bring all that together. And uh, uh, we had about seventy something people participating, but we get it after. You know, we get you know this will be up on our website. Other people can see it. You know, of course you can you know, share it any way you want. We're happy to edit it for you any way you would like. So just let us know how you would like to use it locally. But um, um, I thought it went great. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for promoting it. And uh, I'm very grateful. Um, yeah. For um, that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's great. And I know you'll be. I guess you've already recorded your your remarks for the for the meeting. I know. I was just thinking that I'm like. I think I want to go back and re-record it again because yeah. <laughs> see now it's like can adapt a little bit. I'll have to see what Ali says. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jody. Uh, crushed it as always. Yeah, you really did. It was great. Uh, that was great. I was. Uh, um, yeah, you know, I really appreciate your your you know your remark that uh, uh, getting cured of Hep C you know really helped you feel more in control and a little bit you know, increased your if I remember correctly your you know feelings of self esteem et cetera. And I've heard that from others that, who were you know facing addiction problems and being cured. And and so one question that we didn't really have time for me to ask you was just whether you felt you know. It, through your community outreach, were there other people who felt that same sense of sort of personal empowerment or from their from their hepatitis C cure? If you, if you follow me. Follow um, you know, not and I haven't ever been approached by anybody. Okay. But my hope is that somebody has. My hope that somebody has, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then one question for you, Stu, if I was doing my math correctly, it looked like your reinfection rate's about 20%. Is that right? Probably. Yeah. I mean, it was slow. I, I, I had answered the question. I think there's a few reasons. You know, one, the prevalence is so high that I think like it's not something that we're going to do one shot and it's going to go. You just have to probably accept like just to get that words from the HIV world is if your community viral load so high, it's just going to take time. So, you know, when you almost knock it down here and then you're going to knock it down and just, you have to accept reinfections. Most patients, Hey Jody, we're still actively injecting. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing where we things took a real big hit was COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Because even locally, a lot of those programs in the health center shut down for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no access to primary care. Mental health services and addiction services kind of disappeared. Um, and that seemed to kind of cause a bit of a jump as well. Yeah. yeah. And our harm reduction, yeah. Our harm reduction services stopped there. Not stopped, but they were just um, not as much. Yeah. Open mm -hmm. not as much. So, but... We're trying to adapt. The other thing caught my eye was that you were mentioning in the report something like um, either a social networking approach or a family approach where you would, it seemed like you were, you know, seeking to, um, you know, have people self-refer their injection partners in. And I was thinking, you know, they're trying this in Australia where they're trying to you know, build this uh, sort of protective circle around a cure by treating others and therefore you you don't get as much reinfection. So I, I didn't know how much you were able to really fully implement that kind of social network. Yeah, I mean, Jody, hey, we talked about that. That's a while and we, we kind of never mm -hmm. took it to the, I think COVID just paused everything, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, you've got, you know, we accept 
you know, addiction is a chronic disease. So people are going to relapse and that happens. And if, you know, they do relapse, even if it's once or twice, how do you keep them safe? And if there's a general group of people you inject with treat, you can treat the group at the same time, then, but, yeah. but there's reasons. And, and again, this is where I was like, Jody, why don't you go, I want Jody to go treat and go to the house and have a phone and we just connect or people they trust that they don't even have to come into the health center because there are people who don't, you know, privacy, maybe they know somebody there, or maybe they're, uh, you know, um, one of the counselors or government people. So um, trying a different, a different model to, to get into those cohorts or the, you know, that network. Uh, and I think to do it, we, it can't be really physician or nurse done and, that's yeah, Jody. I mean, we talked about that, and then mm-hmm. I don't know. You would know the best, right? Of how mm-hmm. how that might look or work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that would be. Go ahead. Well, it's just having to. I think my lived experience really has uh, its perks to in, in that area. <laughs> yeah. You know, these are people I used with, and. Um, my, you know, my old dealers and, and things like that and having to make that connection to them. Re, re, like, I feel like I'm in a healthy place where I can reconnect with them and stay safe, you know? Um, and, um, you know, like I was so comfortable with them before and then being able to have these uncomfortable conversations, you know, having that trust. So um, I believe that's where my, uh, my lived experiences are. Uh, as an, as an asset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you. I look forward to staying in touch and um, uh, uh, continuing to follow your program and finding opportunities such as the one we just had to um, get your program in front of other people and have this kind of back and forth with others that are seeking to help not Indigenous communities, but other marginalized communities that have poor access to care. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, it's just great to hear from other programs that are doing amazing work and then we all can learn from each other. Yeah, and pick that's up. the idea. Yeah, that's the idea of the coalition. So keep in touch. Yeah, Thanks you bet. Okay. okay, take care. Okay, okay. bye-bye. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you, Jody. Nice you, Jody. to meet you. Thank See you, Skinner. <laughs>